think everybody's kind of ready and, and expecting. So I don't, okay, I'm going to stop. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, okay. um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Eli Noam. I'm a professor of economics and finance at Columbia University and civilian life um, and uh, director of the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation. I'm pleased to be here to uh, welcome you as your uh, uh, moderate moderator and if necessary your arbitrary arbitra and um, we're going to have a conversation. Uh, a conversation that is really important because this is a precursor to the December meeting of the ITU in which the uh, rules of the telecommunications will be reviewed for the first time in several decades. Important decisions might be taken relating to the governance of the internet too. There's another meeting, internet, uh, what is it, IGF in uh, Baku in uh, um, in, in a few weeks to take place. So this is all part of a preparation. And therefore, this meeting here, dealing with the financial aspects of the future is particularly important. Because telecommunications, in a way, is way too important to leave to the telecommunications engineers, and even more so to the telecommunication lawyers, right? So there is, there's money, and there's finance, and there's investment, and all these things will be discussed here. To make this discussion possible, of course, we uh, thank the ITU, this, the organizer of this event, um, but we also thank uh, uh, McKinsey uh, that has been uh, sponsoring this particular panel uh, and is represented here um, uh, also by Luis Enriquez, uh, who uh, will also be speaking. Now, um, when we talk about funding the future, okay, and if let's kind of keep firmly in mind that we're talking about the future, because it's been said that generals always fight the last war, and maybe regulators also regulate the last crisis, mm. and financiers look back also and then kind of duplicate themselves, so that's usually when they get in trouble. And so we want to think about the next next. Uh, and we also want to think about how investments in this field can perhaps be separated into three different segments. And it's important to s distinguish them, otherwise we're talking about everything and therefore nothing. There is the leading edge, there is the trailing edge, and then there is the mainstream. The trailing edge in some ways is the easiest to understand that we kind of know how to deal with it and we certainly have spoken about this and certainly at ITU events. These are the countries that are less developed, the within countries, the regions that are less developed, uh, social groups that are poor, less educated and how to raise them and bring them into the mainstream is something that needs to be discussed Usually the commercial sector in those situations is not the right sector to deal with that fully because there's not enough money to be made. Therefore, some subsidy mechanism has to be devised. External, internal, we can discuss exactly how it should be funded, but we kind of understand some of the dimensions here. Then there is the leading edge and that's the new technology, and that is a risk factor where companies, when they invest, are taking high risks. But because of the social importance uh, of new technology and new networks and new things, governments at times will be a co-sponsor, will reduce the risk, will take some of the, uh, of the risk itself. And examples to that might be the early internet where the US government took some of the funding and, and the risk in making it possible and then kind of the benefit accrued to many. Now, in between, and here kind of also the mechanisms are already harder. There might be tax advantages, tax benefits in a variety of other ways, or direct government investments in the early stages. In between is the mainstream, uh, and that usually follows the 
leading edge. And usually it is self-sustaining and self-funding. And a good example might be um, mobile wireless in metropolitan areas where the money, the consumer demand, consumer usage is enough to attract investment as long as and then the role of the government might actually be not to be in the way. But, and that's my, those are my last comments here, here too there are challenges. One of the challenges is that government likes to treat that particular part as a cash cow for taxation and for other ways of extracting money in order to put them into other sectors of the economy or for other purposes. Uh, and that might also be the case when it's uh, over the international settlement rates on the issue of whether incoming traffic should be charged a certain amount, something that is being discussed right now. And there are various other ways, such as the discussion over unbundled local loops, in which competition policy enters, and other societal goals of competition, of protection, of development, of taxation, where that big mainstream is being used for other purposes too. So, there's a lot to talk about, and we have wonderful speakers uh, to deal with those subjects, and I will introduce them uh, in sequentially. Uh, the first, uh, first uh, speaker here, it gives me great pleasure to introduce her, is right here to my left, uh, Omombola Johnson, who is the Minister of Communications uh, technology for Nigeria. Uh, she comes here with a very kind of wonderful background. Not only is she the minister, but before that she was in uh, kind of the managing, uh, country managing director of the consulting firm Accenture uh, in Nigeria. Sorry, Louise. All right. Um, so, so, uh, <laughs> Uh, so she had over 25 years of consulting experience and has worked with a cross-section of companies in a variety of industries. Um, she's also the founding chairperson and member of Board of Trustees of Women in Management and Business. Uh, and she has a technology degree in electrical engineering from the University of Manchester and a master's degree in, in digital electronics from King's College. So she comes here from, and she's finishing a doctoral dissertation while being a minister, cabinet minister. Very impressive. <laughs> okay, so she does wonderful things and she will, you will hear from her now directly. Thank you, thank you very much, Eli. I think I have to first thank McKinsey for sponsoring this, uh, <laughs> this forum. But um, I, I think just to make some opening comments, uh, if you look at the future that we're trying to fund right now, is this future that we're talking about, this future of hyper-connectivity where everybody's connected to everybody and it's the internet of, of things. Um, I'm, I'm really going to talk about this from the perspective of Africa. Uh, when you look at the latest um, figures, 2011 figures from the Africa Development Bank, um, what they say was that out of all the funds that went into infrastructure, communications just got 0.5% of that infrastructure. So clearly there's a lot of work to do in terms of funding this uh, infrastructure, this broadband infrastructure we're talking about that connects us all uh, to each other. Over the last 10 years or so, uh, Nigeria has, has um, attracted about $25 billion of investment. So clearly we're doing something right. And so what I wanted to just talk about is what we have done uh, to, to get to this $25 billion. But having said that, the context has changed and we need to be looking at different ways of how we, how we fund uh, this future of connectivity that we're, that we're talking about. Um, there are two perspectives that we need to look at when you're trying to attract funding, and that's the supply side and the demand side. On the, on the supply side, what has been done, or what we've done is really around a very liberal investment policy that attracts investments. It's aligned full foreign ownership, it's a full repatriation of profits, it's a price and autonomy of competition. Uh, of course, the regulator, stability, consistency, and the competence of the regulator has been something that has really helped us to attract those kind of investments. And just like you mentioned earlier, Eli, was the, uh, the um, notion of subsidies. We plow about our uh, annual operating levy for the network operators is 2.5% of their revenue. We take 40% of that into our USB fund that is then devoted to putting infrastructure in the rural, unserved, and underserved areas. And this becomes important, again, to go back to your point, where in countries, most countries in Africa, where the majority of our population lives in the rural areas, in Nigeria it's about 
upwards of 60% live in rural areas that are really of no interest to the commercial operators. So that means that targeting those subsidy funds to those areas becomes very, very uh, important. And we use those funds as incentives to get our infrastructure providers to go to those areas because that's where you can begin to impact people with the connectivity that you, that, that you have. On the, um, on, the demand, on the demand side, so that's the supply side. On the demand side, basically what we need to look at, it's not a case of building this infrastructure and just assuming that they will come. It's a case of actually building the infrastructure and ensuring that um, people begin to use this infrastructure. And that's really around making ICT relevant in the lives of people and ensuring that the investments, the return on investment, that's really where the return on investments begins to play out, where you get people using that infrastructure. So it's delivering government services over the internet, is delivering those targeted subsidies to um, over ICT infrastructure to make sure that the people that need those subsidies are the ones that get them. It's the value-added services that are very important for developing countries, mobile money, uh, drug authentication, getting commodity market prices to, to, um, to rural farmers, entertainment, and of course, device ownership. A lot of the population is poor. We need to begin to think of ways how we can subsidize the device ownership that they can actually access and begin to make, um, uh, make use of this, uh, of this infrastructure that is there. Um, I think finally, in terms of the future, uh, what we need to be looking at is defining ICT infrastructure as critical infrastructure, as important as roads, as ports, as rails, and all of that. And what that means is that government needs to continue to support the investment in, the, in addition to attracting FDI. It's um, the kind of things that we are doing in Nigeria are the domestic infrastructure bonds, where a certain percentage of those funds will be dedicated to ICT infrastructure. It's the public-private sector partnerships that look at how we can begin to partner with the uh, uh, with, with the private sector, particularly for some of those leading edge technologies. Uh, and finally, with our sovereign wealth funds, again, we're dedicating a portion of those funds to funding ICT uh, infrastructure. So, yes, we've been successful, or there has been some success in using subsidies and um, attracting foreign direct investments. But as we're looking at trying to connect more and more people and getting more value on, the, on that infrastructure, we have to begin to look at other means, which are the, uh, the, 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 the local um, <coughs> funding that we have to attract those investments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, promised the speaker, the, the organizers gave the speakers uh, four minutes, three to four minutes, and I promised that I can have one extra minute. If, judging from your faces, they are particularly interesting, speak, giving particularly interesting speech. So definitely uh, there was one of them. Uh, the next one is, uh, next, our next speaker is Ronnie Tay. Uh, who is the CEO of Infocom Development Authority of Singapore, IDA. And the uh, IDA in Singapore is in charge of developing the sector, developing the use of the sector by other industries, and uh, what's the third one is of the use of the government of ICT. Uh, government uh, CIO. Uh, uh, yeah. He has been uh, CEO of this uh, operation, of this agency for, uh, since 2007. And before that, he had been a rear admiral in the Singapore Navy. Thank you, Ali. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first, um, yeah, let me thank uh, ITU for giving me this opportunity to participate in this panel to share about Singapore's uh, perspective and our efforts uh, moving towards greater broadband uh, from both the access and consumption point of view. Uh, we all understand that broadband access is increasingly recognized as key to e the economy, um, and, and that will also lead to economic growth. So in our context, and first, uh, just to a few words about Singapore, uh, we are a small country, about 700 square kilometers, population of 500, uh, sorry, population of 5 million people. Uh, so the numbers that I mentioned uh, should be taken in that context. For us, uh, our main uh, infrastructure for broadband, uh, high speed, Broadband uh, was laid through our what we call the next gen NB and next gen nationwide broadband network. We recognize that as being fundamental to Singapore being an infocom hub, and we envision that uh, the way forward would be to open new doors to increase economic opportunities and transform the way uh, the people live, learn, work, and interact. But while telecoms operators uh, may be well positioned to invest and deploy the infrastructure, they would need to justify the huge financial outlay needed for this network deployment, even to a small country like Singapore, until they have a proven customer demand for higher speeds. So government intervention, financial support, uh, essential to bring about this uh, vision. Um, 
And we are mindful that the next gen MBM would also impact telecoms competition for the next few decades. So when we developed our approach, we took into account the various benefits and challenges uh, brought about by the commercial regulatory and technical factors. And so this approach encompasses both the supply and demand side measures. Uh, on the supply side, included government funding support for our next gen MBN of about uh, 800 million US dollars. And just as an aside, we also have a similar approach towards the wireless broadband, what we call the Wi Fi wireless and SG network, where we have some 7,600 hotspots in our, in our country. <clears throat> now, back to the next gen MBN. Now, in the traditional integrated uh, industry structure, the infrastructure owners would tend to favor their own downstream operators. So, given the, the uh, potential to bring about significant uh, change and comp competitive benefits in Singapore, we wanted to put in place an, what we call an effective open access uh, next-gen NBN. So, in this structure, we have three layers, a passive, active, and, uh, uh, and a service layer at the top where the passive layer uh, will be structurally separated from the above two layers and the active layer operationally separated. Uh, with, this, with the government's funding support, we were able to achieve uh, a quicker rollout. In fact, uh, by middle of this year, some two, two and a half years after we started the deployment, the network has reached 95% of our country. Uh, USO will begin uh, 1st of January next year, uh, and wholesale prices have also dropped. Um, supply side measures were also important to complement the, the demands. Uh, sorry, the, the, the demand side uh, initiatives were also important. So, toward that end, uh, IDEA also worked with various the industry and the end user organizations to tell them about the benefits uh, of broadband uh, to facilitate the creation and adoption of broadband services. Uh, we do this through various means, uh, not forgetting that IDEA also has a few roles, including industry development. So we regularly do calls for collaboration to introduce, to in incentivize uh, the operators, the service providers to develop new uh, innovative services to meet the, the various uh, end user needs. Um, calls for collaboration include things like home-based work or telehealth uh, and, and so on in the education sector. Uh, we also supported the setup of broadband facilities in community centers uh, so that the community at large can have access to high-speed broadband. And of course, as part of our other roles, we also have uh, run training courses to enable our senior citizens to adopt IT. We also established an Infocom Experience Center. That's a permanent showcase of interactive and engaging exhibits that made possible by high-speed broadband. And we did that in a busy part of town to reach out to um, visitors from the public uh, schools, community centers, enterprises, uh, so that they can get a hands-on experience of what uh, high-speed broadband can, can uh, achieve. Uh, I think the results are pretty good so far um, to date because of the uh, effective open access structure that we have. Uh, we have a total of eight opcodes at the active layer and 22 RSPs. Uh, in, in just two years, we, the, the network has rolled out uh, to our 1.1 million households. Uh, in terms of residents taking services, we now have about 200,000 households taking services, and that's about 20% of our population. Thank you so much, and thank you for staying on time. Uh, I'm going to proceed here in the order in which the ITU has given me the, uh, the names, and so, so there's no particular uh, 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 sequencing here, because the next person is David uh, Lewin, who is the director of Plum Consulting. Uh, David Lewin is an expert in the economics and regulation of fixed and mobile telecommunications. He has advised on virtually all aspects of telecommunications regulation in most countries of the world. The, by my calculation, 200 countries, 200 issues, that's what is 4 million type of, <laughs> what type of things. I don't so, think I've so that's, said that's, 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 no. You're a pretty busy guy <laughs> yeah, there. Uh, but uh, that includes uh, consulting for Oman, where David has uh, prepared a plan, mm -hmm. right? and uh, the European uh, <coughs> Commission, uh, where he's been involved in uh, input to the uh, Access and Interconnect Directive in 2000 and to advising on regulation of the NGA, Next Generation Access, in 2009. Right, uh, and more recently. And more recently. Right. Please, David. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me, first of all, thank ITU for inviting me to speak. 
Let me thank Louise for funding this session, and let me thank Eli for moderating it. Um, for about the last five years now, I've been very much involved in this issue of investment in broadband. Uh, and uh, here, I, well, I think what I'd like to talk about in my time is uh, where and how should governments invest uh, in broadband if they're going to maximize uh, economic and social uh, measures for their citizens. Um, and I, I've got five. I hope I make it in the time. Maybe you'll allow me that, that extra minute. The first one I'd say is, and this probably doesn't apply to every single country, but in general I'd say invest to complement what market players are doing. Don't crowd out in, uh, private investment and don't uh, or distort to the minimum extent possible uh, the competition because th th they're both very significant. The second, and again, I think this has been echoed by the two previous speakers, is the importance of investing in uh, demand-side measures. You can have an absolutely wonderful broadband infrastructure, but if everybody in the country isn't regularly using the broadband internet, then you do not have any social or economic benefits from it at all. So those demand-side measures are important. Equally important is to evaluate those demand-side measures. So much government money gets thrown into that pot, uh, but how effective is it? Some of the studies we've done suggests uh, not very. Uh, my third uh, proposition is invest, first of all, in affordable, basic broadband for all before focusing on the stimulation and providing funds for investment in high-speed broadband. All of the studies that we've looked at say there's very strong evidence that you'll get big <coughs> economic gains and a good bang for your buck if you do the former. The evidence that the incremental costs can be justified by the incremental benefits of moving from basic to high-speed broadband is much, much weaker. So there's a priority there. Invest to support a mix of technologies. Um, yes, it's going to be fibre in urban areas, perhaps. It's certainly going to be LTE in most places, but there are also going to be remote areas where satellite might be the appropriate technology. Um, most of that for the market players, but clearly there is a role for government in subsidising satellite because it's not going to be affordable. There isn't going to be the willingness to pay in perhaps subsidising LTE backhaul to rural areas. That's going to be important and one which doesn't actually cost the government any money is releasing all the spectrum that is required, particularly sub one gigahertz for rural areas, in order that mobile broadband can be provided as cheaply as possible. And that then means low prices and affordability. And then finally, I would urge governments not to set unrealistic high minimum speeds for broadband. If we contrast here what's happened in the US, where they set this minimum speed at 4 megabits per second for 2020, with Europe, where they've set the speed at 30 megabits per second by the same date, uh, which one would I vote for? Well, I think I'd go for the American model. It seems to me that the European model runs a very distinct danger that if everybody is working to that target, you're raising the unit costs of supplying universal broadband, which means higher prices, which means no affordability, or alternatively, it means much, much bigger subsidies, uh, which many governments around the world, and particularly in Europe at the moment, cannot afford. I know that they've received a massive injection of funds from the Nobel Committee uh, today, but um, I don't think it's gonna cover it. Thank you. <laughs> David has given the uh, EU exactly one day of honeymoon before engaging in criticism. All right. Um, and uh, our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Luis Enriquez, who is the uh, senior partner at McKinsey Belgium. Um, he, uh, he comes with a kind of very interesting international background, which includes uh, um, he's native of Chile in South America. 
He then moved north uh, and got a doctorate in Berkeley in the United States and worked uh, at the Federal Communications Commission in Washington at the Office of Plans and Policy with the chief economist. Um, and then he was worked with uh, telecommunications and energy firms in the United States and moved to um, McKinsey and to Belgium. And he, of course, uh, we are grateful to him and his company for sponsoring this session. Um, thank you, thank you, Eli. Um, thank you for coming. Um, yeah, I've bounced around the world a little bit, I guess. Um, and I've tried to unlearn everything that I learned in the FCC since then. This was a long time ago. We were putting in the, um, the 1996 Telecoms Act in, in place. And I think we came up with perhaps some things that were a bit too complicated. I've learned, I've learned to do better now, at least, at least make it simpler. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, less around what government should do and more a little bit about what, what I would say more what we see a holistic view on why we're in this room and why these things are a challenge. Um, we think that these NGN uh, networks are actually different. They uh, represent a completely different challenge from the way regulation has had to deal with the sector since we started opening the markets in the early, in the early 80s in Japan and the US. Um, and the key here is infrastructure. The, 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 these represent a significant amount of infrastructure, um, whether it be mobile or whether it be fixed. Um, in the fixed, um, we did some rough estimates that we said the fiber in Europe to have a, a 50 to 60% penetration would cost between 200 to 300 billion euros clearly beyond the ability of the industry to pay by itself in the current industry performance levels. Um, and to put an LTE network for one operator would cost about 45 to 50 billion euros. Um, by the way, by contrast, the United States already has an LTE network and they only need another three to four billion dollars to complete coverage in 95% of the country. So the, the financial challenges, the scale, the step function is substantial. And um, the first point to this is this industry lives and dies by capex, by infrastructure investment. If you actually measure it as a percent of sales, there is no industry in the world that is as capex intensive. The average of the industry is between 10 and 15 to 20 percent of revenue spent on capex every year. The next industry that comes close to it is German automobiles, which spend about 10 percent of the revenues. Then steel is about 5 percent, cement is about 4 percent. Nobody invests as much as telcos today. And so if you do not create the incentives for investment, you don't get the investment. The problem is that our entire regulatory apparatus has actually been about slicing and dicing existing networks to encourage prices to go down and encourage more traffic to go up. And it's been hugely successful on existing networks. The one area we did not do that was in mobile. And in mobile, it exploded. And we also, by the way, it was combined with a once in a lifetime sort of technological leap to mobility, which we, we probably will not see again. We will see additional benefits in there, but we will not see uh, the leap. So what happens is if you don't get this right, you don't get investment. And if you don't get investment, um, you don't get NGNs. So our, uh, we think that in general, we, we have something we call the US-based model, which basically means uh, operators, go do what you want. Invest in it, it's yours. You can monetize it whichever way you can. People make investments, you get more or less significant rollout. And the logic there is our starting conditions are enough to have two com compet competitors in place. In Asia, we fund it, we subsidize it. The Singaporeans did it, the Koreans have done it, the Hong Kongs have done it, and so on. Europe hasn't. Europe has a huge issue there. Uh, it is not about Europe, but actually it does highlight this problem. Uh, an implication for this, by the way, is that if you don't get this right, if you're not pragmatic about it, you don't get the investment. You can make all the declarations you want, but you don't get it. Um, and so the implications for us, for the operators, um, particularly in places like Europe or in places that do not have this today, is work pragmatically with your regulators on the government, probably more often the government, about how to figure a solution to this. Because we think if you don't address it, you store political trouble 10 years down the line. And for regulators, do not ignore the underlying economics of the industry, which are massive investments done by only two or three players. This is not about free markets. If you don't create incentives for those, inv those players, you don't get the investment. That's it. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I will now uh, uh, recognize our last uh, speaker on this panel. Uh, 
Andrei uh, Mukhanov, who is the, uh, of the Ministry of Telecom and Mass Communications of the Russian Federation. He is the director of the department and chairman of the Commission for International Cooperation Coordination of the Regional Commonwealth in the Field of Communications, RCC. Uh, he is, uh, on top of it, also an academician of the International Telecommunications uh, Academy. Uh, his experience goes back to communication satellites, to uh, defense, to <coughs> natural resources and climate change. Uh, his studies in, at the university level included a really interesting combination of radio engineering and diplomacy. Uh, so uh, give us a little bit of both, please. Uh, so uh, here we go. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like uh, to thank uh, the authorities of uh, United uh, Arab uh, Emirates for uh, hospitality, for good organization of uh, our event. Uh, to thank uh, ITU, uh, all the colleagues. Uh, uh, and uh, um, I'd like uh, to um, uh, propose you the uh, new new and maybe a little strange argument uh, which uh, we can uh, use uh, discussing uh, the uh, uh, TMT, uh, I mean technology, media and uh, telecommunication, TMT grows. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, argument, uh, argument uh, is uh, the uh, uh, middle class. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the uh, uh, specialists uh, from uh, Cisco, from uh, Russian uh, CNews agency for investigation, uh, which are correlated uh, with uh, our official point of views uh, and uh, which are a base uh, for uh, my uh, information. Uh, now, Russia. Uh, has uh, all ingredients uh, for uh, big uh, TMT growth and uh, these ingredients uh, for the next uh, 10 years are uh, the first uh, underpenetrated market, uh, the, uh, an already uh, deployed advanced uh, LTE network, uh, the uh, lower uh, handset prices uh, to support uh, affordability. But uh, the most important uh, and a fast uh, growing uh, middle class seeking and uh, able uh, to afford uh, new services uh, and thus uh, support uh, abnorm abnormal growth. It seems to me uh, that uh, we uh, tick uh, all the boxes, uh, all uh, these uh, four boxes. Uh, and uh, the hour, uh, and we hope uh, for the, uh, first of all, for the first, uh, for the uh, middle class. Uh, now, a global uh, data market uh, is estimated uh, as about uh, uh, $300 billion, American dollars, and uh, that the Russia's uh, underpenetrated market uh, should push uh, the current 22% uh, to above 30% uh, uh, before uh, 2015. Uh, with uh, Russian middle class uh, who can afford uh, smartphones and, tab and tablets, uh, uh, with uh, Russian middle class uh, set to more than a triple in the next uh, eight years. Uh, the need for data usage uh, should boom. And uh, the middle class uh, seems uh, happy to pick up uh, the check uh, for uh, data. Uh, some words regarding uh, internet, gaming, and uh, e-commerce. Uh, we expect uh, internet penetration uh, in our land to increase uh, from uh, 48 uh, percent uh, to uh, 87 uh, by uh, 2020. Uh, regarding e-commerce, uh, 15 uh, percent uh, from now till uh, the same uh, <coughs> uh, till uh, 20, uh, 2020. 
Uh, for example, uh, Russian uh, <coughs> main uh, Russian uh, uh, browsers uh, as Yandex and Mail.ru uh, look well uh, placed uh, to benefit from growth in the segments uh, and the need uh, to retain uh, their uh, leading positions uh, on the market. And uh, once again, uh, I, th I see that the key investment, a key investment case for uh, Russia 2020, uh, first of all, should be based on the middle uh, class uh, increasing uh, threefold uh, by uh, this year. I mean, uh, from now till 2020. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll take now one round here in which uh, people can perhaps relate to some of the th other things that they've heard here on the panel so we don't just talk in tracks parallel to each other. Uh, I'll start by saying, by observing that, uh, that government, and, and nobody really touched this except for David a little bit, I think that government has, in addition to money or instead of money, also to give out an important resource and that is spectrum, which is valuable. Uh, but in fact, if anything, the, uh, uh, the auction mechanism has actually been used to take money out of the system rather than to put it in because the money typically is not being recirculated into the ICT sector but used for the general purpose. And there's nothing wrong with that except it is, in a way, another cost <coughs> of entering uh, and creating networks, in some cases, significant. The amount of monies that uh, Luis uh, mentioned a study that we did at Columbia said that there was, uh, that for the United States alone, uh, the investment that was needed for broadband infrastructure in the past 10 years, plus projected by the various companies into the next 10 years, on, is about a quarter of a trillion dollars together. If you add that to that, also the private investment, the Wi-Fi routers and the um, the, the devices in people's homes and pockets, if you add those on top of it, it's about half a trillion dollars of investment. That's an awful lot of money. That's just one country, the United States. So now projected to the entire world. So that's a very fundamental issue here that Luis is, is identifying the kind of the huge need of investments. Now on top of it, when you have a competitive environment, the marginal costs are very low. Right? And therefore, in a competitive environment, the prices are subject to deflation and low prices, which is great for us as consumers, but a problem to us as producers. And therefore, there is that disconnect of more and more being used, but not more necessarily more revenues being uh, gained or profits being gained in order to recirculate it as investment. And that is one of the dilemmas of the industry. Uh, there are more minutes, more bits, more of everything consumed at growth rates, which is just phenomenal, but not revenue-wise and not profit-wise. And that, of course, creates barriers to investment. So I think I'd like kind of to go now in the comments in the reverse order. Um, and uh, Andre, maybe you want to start, and then we go Luis and David and so on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and. Uh if we say about the role uh, of uh, government, uh, of uh, government uh, in uh, investment of uh, the, uh, any projects uh, and uh, big and not so big projects uh, in uh, the uh, in uh, these fields, uh, I think that uh, the uh, main active role uh, it is a role of uh, business or private sector. Uh, and the uh, private sector uh, has uh, money. Uh, government uh, see this, uh, <coughs> government uh, can see the strategy. And uh, maybe uh, if, uh, for example, uh, uh, biz uh, business, if business uh, says I can, uh, then a government uh, says you may. Uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, in Russia, uh, we uh, have a partnership uh, bet between uh, government uh, and uh, business and uh, between the government and private sector. Uh, for example, uh, you know maybe uh, the uh, big uh, Russian uh, company, uh, com uh, <coughs> the such uh, Russian companies uh, as uh, Rostelecom and the Big Troika. And uh, which is responsible uh, for uh, many uh, project, projects, uh, projects uh, uh, which uh, use uh, the uh, two uh, two sources uh, two sources of uh, investment, and uh, they own uh, uh, money and uh, investment uh, from the uh, governmental side. We have a partnership. So. Um, Thank you. Uh, so, some quick comments. For um, we don't we don't take an, uh, at McGinsey we tend to work a lot with obviously with large companies, but we've also worked um, quite a bit with governments, in, including uh, Singapore and a few governments in the region. Um, the, the way we see this is there are multiple objectives for the sector. We actually did some work for the mobile industry, in which we sort of said. Um, there are three simple ways of measuring the, the industry at the time of the launch of the SM. Price, rollout, and um, uh, penetration. And what we found was that there seemed to be a sweet spot in industry structure. Why? Because of the structure of the industry. Very, very high upfront capex, very, very low cost to deliver a minute of a call or a byte of traffic. If you have 10 players, what actually happens is that the price collapses to that marginal cost, and it cannot pay for investment. Obviously, you don't have that because there was investment to begin with. So what you actually see is you see a decline in rates of investment. You see a decline in coverage out there. And we compare the Philippines with India. And my apologies to anybody in India here. I'm simply pointing out the different objectives. And when we compare them, actually, in the Philippines, they were basically it's a two-player market. There are three players, but it's effectively a two-player market. India, it's depending on which circle you go, it's anywhere between a, a five to six to a 12 player market, although some of the 12s have now lost their licenses and so on. But the reality is they want a large number of players. And what we saw was that prices in India were one tenth those of the Philippines. But investment levels were one quarter those of the Philippines per capita. So if you actually want investment, then the price issue is a trade off and you need to manage it. At the same time, if you actually start moving more extensively towards rural areas, you see much less coverage in India. At the time, I think coverage was about 60, 65%. I don't know what the latest number is. The Philippines, with the islands, an archipelago of 1,000 islands, had 95% coverage. Now, I will recognize these numbers are kind of fluid and depends on how to refine them, but the reality was that the two-player market was delivering on coverage and delivering on investment, not delivering on prices. Prices were higher. So these are trade-offs that have to be managed. And for us, actually, um, indeed, to the point of, of Eli, that many governments look at licenses without thinking of the impact of, of that license on the industry structure. They view it as either a revenue source or they view it as a, I'm going to bring prices down without understanding that there are other things you need to trade off. So for us, this NGN debate is about actually understanding what drives that investment and understanding what industry structure can make that investment supportable either by a combination of a government and, and, and private funding or by a private-only funding. The U.S. is basically a fixed duopoly, cable and, and fixed. Thank you, Lars. Quick comments. David. Okay. Uh, well, I think Eli has put his finger on the, the fundamental problem, which is to get this massive amount of investment that's required uh, in order to fund a broadband. Um, and I think across the whole panel, um, my sense is that we're agreed that the vast majority of that investment has to come from the private sector. And I would certainly agree with Louise that uh, there's some things fundamentally wrong with regulation in Europe, particularly in terms of fixed broadband and fixed broadband investment incentives. I won't deal with mobile. I think I pretty much agree with everything you said. I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes giving you a sort of case study of, of, of maybe what it has gone wrong in Europe, uh, it's something to be avoided rather than to be copied. Um, and, and that is that in Europe, uh, unbundled local loops for copper broadband were, were a great, great success. And 
what the national regulators in the 27 member states have done is they have just transferred that set of rules from copper, where the investment was already made by the monopoly incumbents many years ago, to fibre, where the investment still has to be made. And the rules meant that the investment case for investing in fibre was, certainly fibre to the home, was extremely weak. And there's, there's been ver very little of it by the main players. Um, the good news is that I think this problem has at last been recognised. The, the, the financial institutions have hammered on the door of uh, the person responsible at the Commission, Nelly Crows, and said, look, there isn't any investment, and this is why there isn't any investment. You have to do something about it. And in July of this year, she actually made an announcement, uh, which we had certainly worked on some of the, the details of for some of the players, um, which said, look, we can't go on as we are. The, the regulatory model is broke. We need to fix it. We need to move from something which said you've got to unbundle, as a major player, you've got to unbundle your fibre and you've got to provide it to access seekers at a price which is cost-oriented uh, to one which is based essentially on you can have the pricing flexibility that you want but you must provide on an open access basis that's non-discriminatory and no margin squeeze. Those, were, those are kind of the new rules. Oh, and the other important bit of the new rule is it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay stable for 10 years. So these are the kinds of things which we think will substantially strengthen the case for investment in Europe and there may be things that need to be thought about uh, across the world as a whole when it comes to creating investment incentives for fibre. Well, we had uh, several uh, market uh, advocates here, appropriately to my right. Now I will uh, turn to the left here uh, for perhaps uh, people, partly because they had responsible positions in government who uh, stressed the role of government here. And uh, right, um, uh, maybe we'll hear bigger. from Singapore first, which of course is the model for successful exercise of, gov of a governmental role just as Dubai is. Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so clearly government has a role to play uh, in, in, in co-funding. And I would say that in co-funding, we tend to uh, fund minor, more the minor portion rather than the major portion. Uh, and, and that, I think, helps to lower risk and uh, encourages uh, the industry to invest and provide services. And we do that um, certainly in the, you know, in, in the end user services side. And of course, as I've explained earlier, uh, in, the, in the something as, as, as large as the broadband network. But I think uh, when governments um, um, provide investment, I think uh, it's important to be clear what the objectives are. So I, I think uh, some of these objectives, like um, um, we, we, I, I shared earlier on our network, is um, you know, objectives um, in um, open access, for example. Uh, otherwise, if, because that's an opportunity for the government to, to set out requirements that can better shape the structure going forward. Um, so in terms of um, open access, so that you can have a higher level competition at the top, and also recognizing that in, in this sort of a massive uh, structure, uh, it's largely a monopoly. Uh, I mean, not everyone can put in nationwide uh, networks, you know, two and two or three. Uh, in, in our case, uh, certainly so, especially the residential area, uh, when it concerns are bringing the fiber down into the individual homes, um, you, you're not likely to get, you know, the home uh, opening the door to different providers coming in. Um, Price control um, and, and through the funding, uh, being able to uh, ensure that prices are kept sufficiently low. And, and that is a useful benefit because with um, competitive pricing, it actually encourages uh, widespread adoption uh, by, by end users and consumers. And that's important. Um, you know, with high speed broadband, I think, is widely recognized as a way to go. Um, earlier in the other session, we talked about how everything is video-based now, and when they talk about video, it's certainly high speed. 
uh, whether for education, for business, for gaming, for watching TV and so on. So with lower prices uh, through investments, it encourages wider adoption. Uh, and in return, I think the end service providers from the tel telco industry would also benefit from that. Uh, thank you, Rani. And uh, now, Minister Johnson. Um, I, I think that we, we operate in an industry that is completely liberalized. And so I think that there's got to be a fine balance between uh, policy and regulation, uh, the incentives that government will give to attract that, uh, uh, that investment, and of course the private sector investments. When you look at the, some of the numbers that you've spoken about, these are few, fairly huge investments that need to be made, and the numbers you talked about were in countries where some of that infrastructure is already in place. Uh, in a country like Nigeria, where a large part of that infrastructure is not in place, we've got about 6% broadband penetration. It's important that you look at these three factors. Uh, first of all, what does the regulator have to do? So, uh, first of all, at the policy level, how do we, <clears throat> in, a, in, a, in, a, in an industry that we have said at a policy level is completely liberalized, the government will not make any more investments, but uh, that's what we said 10, year, 10 years ago. Uh, the regulator has to create that enabling environment that ensures that that, uh, that investment comes in. But I think that as the years go by, what we found is that because we've made it a very private sector driven, market oriented industry, we found that there are great pockets of the country that don't have this infrastructure, this investment. And so therefore, I, I think that we need to go beyond the incentives that we're given um, uh, operators or infrastructure providers to invest in these particular areas because again like I said in my opening remarks 70% of our population lives in these rural areas they are mostly poor they can't afford the kind of um, prices we're talking about and they're also very sparsely populated so they're you know <laughs> clusters of, um, of, of density all, all around the all around the country so we need to begin to think of it's, it's a kind of hybrid model there'll be situations where government may need to enter into a public-private partnership and actually also put some money down, so, uh, uh, put some money down for rolling out some of that, uh, some of that fiber. Uh, we also need to look at, in the instance where government does invest, it has to be purely open access so that everybody has um, access to that, uh, to that infrastructure. I think I'd also like to make the point around not only attracting investment into the infrastructure, but we need to also attract investment into the demand side. I think that's very, very important, and we, and we, shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that, because Building this infrastructure, yes, is going to take a lot of money, it's going to take collaboration between government and private sector, but two things are very important, device, device, uh, device affordability, and we need to begin to look at how we can uh, get more devices into the hands of people, whether it's smartphones, tablets, whatever it is, that people can, uh, that, that people can, uh, can afford and they can begin to use to get on that um, uh, uh, to get on the infrastructure. And the second thing is making investments into the value-added services because that's where people begin to get the benefits. And that's what we're doing right now. It's making investments in software development, particularly mobile applications. We've seen the, uh, the success of mobile money in East Africa. In a country like Nigeria, you've got 167 million people. Uh, you know, relatives are urban areas, rural areas. Having a means by which you can transfer money uh, safely and securely is very, very important for economic development. So looking at uh, those kind of applications, we're looking at health applications where one of the um, uh, uh, most important life-saving uh, applications is a simple SMS. You buy a drug, there's a code on it, you type that code in, you get an SMS to tell you whether the drug is authentic or not. This, is, this has saved millions of lives. So investing into people that actually develop that um, that software, uh, the mobile application ecosystem is very, very important uh, to ensure that once we build this infrastructure, it becomes an important part of not just economic development, but also social development as well. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, we are perhaps ready to uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, and if you do so, uh, there is a microphone somewhere. <coughs> and uh, please identify yourself. And uh, if you give a speech, I will cut you off after 20 minutes. Right? <laughs> okay. The, the lights aren't good. Okay. Uh, Alan Horn, telecom regulator in a small place called Vanuatu. And I've moved from the very busy, hectic, large uh, markets to the extremity where the challenges, I think, are probably the most significant in the world in how do we get 
communities connected in very remote areas where governments have very little money. So how on earth do we fund that? And I wonder, I've heard, I think, a little bit from uh, Minister Johnson and some very good points there. But I'd like to hear from the other panel members the challenges to these re very remote uh, communities with governments with, with little or no money to be able to put uh, into those infrastructure. Uh, the population of Vanuatu is what? 250,000 people okay. over 63 islands. All right, so they... <laughs> 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 See, <laughs> yeah, exactly. if, if, if you were not a country but a company, you would go out of business. Um, we'll, have, we'll have two, or two, two people here if they would like to respond to that, I'm at most. To at most two, yes. Okay. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm, my, my message is not a positive one, I'm afraid. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how you square that circle. Somebody said foreign aid. That sounds quite good to me. Um, I guess there is, uh, the obvious technology is, is, is satellite technology for, for that kind of broadband. I'm sure there's cellular to some extent. And with cellular, there's room for the government to really accelerate the uh, liberalization of, uh, or the, uh, the allocation of sub one gigahertz. I'm not quite sure what world region you're in, uh, but uh, the maximum amount as quickly as possible will help with the more concentrated population centers. And then for the rest, as far as I can see, it's satellite. KA band satellite is getting better. Um, you might be able to get something to some people um, if you uh, choke the speeds back a bit. But closes that circle between willingness to pay on the one hand and cost on the other. But it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's a mm -hmm. really tough one. I'll, I'll pass this on perhaps to Ronnie, because Singapore, maybe this, you're an extreme case, but Singapore is a small country, and they've done pretty well. Uh, <clears throat> yes, we are a small country in population and in size. We don't quite have so many islands. Uh, I frankly don't have a solution for that, unfortunately. Um, and for us, uh, I, I, I mean, we, we have our sort of digital divide or digital inclusion issue that we try to address. Um, you know, uh, schools with uh, homes, with, households with school going children provide some subsidy uh, and, and provide all sorts of um, incentives for adoption and so on. But uh, I think not, nothing near as the scale of uh, Vanuatu that, that has just been shared. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll take the next question. Uh, yes, please, sir. Um, Bashi Patel from the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization. We've heard from the panelists uh, talk about the public-private partnership models. Um, we have a quite a diverse view uh, from the World Bank studies on public-private partnerships. Some of the findings I've heard in terms of public-private partnerships, particularly in respect to UK, that they haven't actually worked for infrastructure projects as effectively as they should have done. Um, just wanted to get an opinion how effective do, does the panelists think public-private private partnership model can work in the ICT sector. Thank you. I think you would be perfectly well positioned to respond to that. Yeah. Um, I actually think it can work quite well. Um, if I just make the point of, um, before I talk about the ICT sector, we've had some very successful uh, public-private sector partnerships, particularly in the transportation, where we've, um, you know, government has partnered with people to build to build roads. They're told, and clearly the road is maintained on them. So I, I think that in the ICT sector, it really depends on what each party is bringing to the table, and that's the key to the success. Um, in, in in ICT, I think what what is important is, for instance, we're talking about fibre, which means that um, a right of way becomes very very important. Uh, 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 things like um, the right, right away becomes very, very important, and also uh, the uh, uh, the vulnerability of that infrastructure, particularly again in countries like developing countries. And I think that in a in a private in a PPP in the ICT infrastructure, the funding will primarily come from the from the private sector. But what the private sector is looking for for government to to give is some levels of assurances on things like uh, the right away potentially making that free, because that's that's uh, that's one of the biggest costs 
of, uh, of, of fiber optic. That, that's what government brings to the table. Uh, again, it's protecting that infrastructure, making sure that once the investment is made, that infrastructure is protected. And that protection comes from government, so that's what government brings to the table. So I think that they can work if it is clear what each side is bringing to the table. So private sector, definitely the funding, but government is really protecting that funding, making sure the return on investments will be there. You know, we're talking about fairly long gestation periods for um, ICT, ICT infrastructure, and that comes from um, stability of the of regulation, stability of policy, um, stability of policy, and also given the things the private sector invests that nobody else can give apart from government. We'll take the thank you very much. We'll take the next question uh, in the back. Well, hi. This is Bala from uh, IBM. I'm a little speech talent right now, so bear with me. Um, the question I have is what uh, Lewis mentioned earlier about a, what is it, 40, 50 billion dollars for LTE? Okay. I mean, some of those figures are extremely challenging, so I'm wondering in your model, if you have looked at CapEx sharing through cloud, or a revenue share model to, to develop some kind of rule of thumb for those investments. OK, well, the Just, question was kind of clearly directed at one of the panelists. So Luis, take um, a go so, at it. So um, <clears throat> the issue whether we're in Europe is a little bit having to do with where they chose to put the spectrum. So they, they've gone above the one gigahertz for LTE. That makes it much more expensive. Um, there's a second problem, and that is that the sector has ground to a halt on the mobile side. And so revenues, the, the incremental revenue case is rather difficult. So these networks are, are a bit stuck. There are all these, all these pronouncements that we're going to build it, we're going to build it, but it doesn't get built. Um, the, uh, there are a couple of things that are going to drive this. What, CapEx, I mean, sharing is actually happening, and it's moving ahead. The trick there is actually how to manage the antitrust and the, the monopolistic issues. Also, what level of the network do you share? What's the biggest chunk of the expense that you're going to share? In general, we see that there is less sort of active layer sharing, uh, but some of the passive so, or the intelligence part of the network basically ends up being their own operators, but some parts of the active layer and a lot of the passive layer can be, can be shared. That works in markets where there is some amount of symmetry between the players. So there's no two gigantic one and two, and two really, really small three and fours, or it's really, really small three. Because if you share, then you're giving the three a competitive leg up relative to the other two. And so you don't, the, the, the level to which this will happen in Europe, um, we think actually Europe has a problem. Uh, and the level to which it will actually move on is to the extent that regulators are flexible about allowing the sharing, and also the level to which there is alignment in the, in the we would say, the strategic and economic interests of each player. So we actually don't see sharing in some countries where it would make sense to happen. In India, you see a lot of sharing nowadays. So if you look at the growth market, you would say there is a move towards sharing? Not in the growth. So in a growth market, I can differentiate through coverage much more. So I'd rather not share if I'm the big guy. Uh, Why me, would I want to do that? Okay. I, I will. Uh, we, we've had here, despite the Nobel Prize, there's... Uh, at least two critical voices, and I'm not so hot myself about that. Either, is there anybody here who would like to take a position that kind of explains, defends? Uh, are you rising in defense of the uh, Brussels uh, Commission? Hello, good day, Christoph Legutko, Intel. I am not going to defend the European Commission. I was going to speak about the decision about, of the European Commission. I was observing with uh, interest the remarks of Mr. Enriquez and Mr. Levin about uh, the challenge of Europe, no fiber, and about not, no investment in Europe in fiber. The scenario was, on the one hand, American one, the operator owns and operates. The result is the availability of fiber to the home in the U.S. is 40% of households. The scenario in Europe, we have unbundling, no investment, 0.9% of fiber to the home. The question, I think Mr. Levin will, uh, could answer that. 
why European Commission in her announcement uh, in June stopped in the half the way? They encouraged, encouraged in their announcement uh, investment in fiber, and immediately they um, mentioned or announced the rules how to invest, how to pay, how to share, uh, how to finance that fiber. After that announcement, the German Telecom told, okay, beautiful, we have a new rules, we have a plan how to invest 200,000 households a year, 40 million households in Germany, 200 years, we are ready. <laughs> so why they are not going to abound? Um, what was the reason why the Commission doesn't abound uh, unbounding in Europe? Thank you. All right. Uh, this was, although this was to some extent a comment rather than a question, we'll take it anyway. Oh, I, I saw it as a question at any rate, um, which I'd like to answer. And I, I think that the, the answer is in two parts. First, as far as the European Commission is concerned, I'm pretty sure that the, the Nelly Cruz and her cabinet are, are clear as to what needs to be done. They're not going to go to the American model. I think that will be considered politically unrealistic and perhaps unwise, um, but they want something which gives the investor a, a much stronger business case for, for building with fiber. I think the Deutsche Telekom uh, position is one of not so much what Nelly Crow has announced was bad, but we don't believe it will happen because um, there is an awful lot of regulators uh, national regulators, there's Beric, uh, the, the, the Association of Regulators, and there's an awful lot of small alternative network operators who are going to fight tooth and nail to change those rules to ones which leave us pretty much with the, the status quo. And I think that is the challenge over the next 12 to 18 months, is to, to convert uh, Nelly Cruz's statement into something which actually does make the investment start to flow. Um, can I just, just to give context to, 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 to what's happening in Europe, it's worth pointing out that the bulk of the money that is being spent in Europe and the bulk of the announcements are not about fibre to the home at the moment. They are about fibre to the node rather than fibre to the home. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, some words uh, regarding uh, example or examples uh, of uh, PPPs uh, and the level uh, of uh, Europe, uh, level uh, of negotiations uh, uh, between Russia and uh, Western Europe. Yes, uh, we uh, have uh, two examples uh, when uh, we uh, try to task uh, a uh, very uh, difficult, uh, uh, very difficult uh, problem uh, with uh, pro problem with uh, roaming, and uh, we initially uh, we uh, <coughs> uh, I mean Russia uh, has uh, had uh, uh, negotiations, uh, the meeting uh, with uh, Nelly Cruz, and. Uh, on, on <coughs> Uh, we uh, uh, after that me uh, after that meeting we uh, decided uh, during this meeting we decided uh, to uh, go uh, by the way of uh, uh, bilateral cooperation uh, and uh, we uh, signed uh, some uh, uh, memorandum. Uh, between Russia and uh, some countries of uh, Western Europe. The fir first memorandum uh, was signed uh, by uh, Ex-Minister and uh, Her Excellency uh, uh, Sylvie Linden with our uh, uh, Minister uh, Igor Shogolev. Uh, and uh, uh, this memorandum is example of PPPs. Uh, some part of uh, memorandum is uh, the decision of uh, regulators about uh, their strategy. And the uh, second part of memorandum is the uh, decision, the words uh, of uh, uh, companies, uh, the word of operators, 
uh, who uh, I agree, uh, who I agreed uh, who I agreed uh, to uh, elaborate uh, the mutual uh, rules uh, of uh, uh, of uh, cost degrees ter tariff degrees. Uh, and uh, the same uh, the same situation we uh, have uh, in uh, the field of uh, frequency uh, coordination uh, with, with uh, be between Russia and uh, Western European countries. Uh, there, there are several several um, um, people here. One I have already recognized right here, and you're next. And and while this is taking place, let me just kind of comment here that. Partly with the European policy, which I'm not defending, by the way, in, in, is, is, however, is to make it cheaper. It's not so much to perhaps to encourage the infrastructure, relatively speaking, but to encourage the users of the infrastructure, the people and the companies that are heavy uh, users of uh, internet type and type services, and they. Perhaps I have not heard much from them here, but maybe there will be some who will speak up. Yes, sir. Uh, Sahlaita from uh, Libyan Telecom. Uh, just I have a comment more than a question, which is uh, uh, building the infrastructure which is needed for uh, mobile broadband and for fixed broadband is more of a challenge in the developing countries because it was a challenge in the UK and the US and it's still a challenge, uh, but more, ch more of a challenge in the developing countries. So. My comment is that uh, governments and operators uh, need to work to reduce this challenge. In terms of governments, uh, effective regulation and uh, promotion of the ITC industry to help monetize the infrastructure. Uh, from the operator's side, I think they have to invest more in uh, the development of uh, new solutions and new applications uh, to help monetize the infrastructure, to expedite uh, the return on investment. Uh, the other thing uh, important uh, on the operator's side is the efficient utilization of the fiber or of the infrastructure in their own countries, uh, which is, has to do with the regulation also. But uh, they have to work with the utilities, with other operators, uh, because it's extremely expensive for developing countries to invest or duplicate the, um, any investment in the infrastructure. So operators has to work uh, harder to monetize, and the government has to have effective regulations to, uh, to help the utilization of the fiber. Thank you. But thank you very much, sir. We'll have here, because we're running out of time, we'll have here as the last comment, perhaps. Yes, thank you. And then we'll... Uh... Yes, uh, my name is Sami Al-Bashir. I am with the Saudi Communication Commission. Uh, from all the discussion, there are two schools of thoughts. One is uh, heavy regulation is not good, the example of Europe. I'm just making things here simpler, maybe to make sure that I understood. Uh, government is not able to provide uh, the investment and relying on the private sector to do that. So we're in a dilemma here, especially like my colleague from Libya, Telecom, the developing countries are watching. I think the message need to be stressed is in any strategy. Either you have a strategy or don't stop the operators or the private sector or whoever to start uh, building the fiber to the home or any kind of broadband. If we keep waiting, and especially in the developing countries, to have the perfect strategy, we will never get there. So like our experience in, in uh, the mobile, I think, the sooner you start, the better. No matter what strategy you have. Of course, it's, it's better to have a good strategy, but if you don't have it, please don't stop those people who have the money to invest <laughs> and even uh, even uh, probably cover the urban area which is more profitable to them but to have it there it's it's better not to have it at all thank you i, I think it's an excellent point i would in fact add to that that even if you have a good strategy to implement it on a governmental using the governmental processes uh, somebody here 
mentioned to me earlier the, the problems of uh, procurement, of public procurement, and the problems that there are, even if you have a great idea, but just kind of getting it through parliaments and appropriations may take years, and in the meantime, uh, things have moved on. Uh, speaking of moving on, we have perhaps uh, two or three minutes to conclude, and so if everyone gives, takes one minute of the speakers to just say what they take out of this session. Um, I think clearly there are different models. Uh, I, I think uh, different countries have really different uh, situations, whether you're geographically big, whether you're, you know, the, the economic affordability of, of, of the end users, the citizens, or the affordability of government are all clearly different. Even the technologies are different, I, I, you know, whether it's fixed, whether it's mobile or even satellite uh, uh, in, in Singapore. We recognize that um, even though we, um, we this mobile broadband is so pervasive today and important and we are having LTE services, but I think a fixed broadband is also important and in fact it also provides a backhaul for the mobile services and so on. I think, but I think clearly um, governments, the regulators, the industry, as well as the end user sectors all have a part to play uh, in, 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 in coming together to work out the relevant the models that are relevant and applicable for success in, in any particular country or situation? I think for me, there, there are four takeaways from, from the discussion. I think first of all is the fact that there needs to be a, a balance between uh, government funding and private sector funding of, this, of the build out of this infrastructure. I think secondly is the importance of incentives, particularly to incentivize the build out into the rural, uh, unserved and, uh, and underserved area, incentivized by, by government. I think the third thing is also to really examine the impact of regulation and it's that fine balance again between very heavy regulation and then leaving it completely to the market to decide what to do where of course there are dangers and risks in that as well so it's really having that balance between, uh, between regulation and, and the fourth and final thing is really that we need to simultaneously invest in both the supply side and also the demand side of the, of the uh, broadband uh, equation. Thank you. Well, I, after that, I'm not sure I want to say anything. <laughs> but of course I will. <laughs> I can't resist. Um, I, I'd just like to sort of offer an idea, a very s simple idea, uh, that, that is prevalent in Scandinavia, uh, which is in some ways a third way, and that is distressing the importance of having fibre delivering high speeds to within, shall we say, two kilometers of every house. It, n not perhaps in the very remote areas, but in a lot of the rural areas. And then maybe people will come and they'll want to connect, either as communities, or it will be for the back call of a mobile phone company. But an important role for government is to make sure, whatever happens, that that core backbone network is in place. And if the market isn't providing it, to think about how it can provide it. Because at least if you've got that, you are giving people the opportunity to do things for themselves. And it's quite clear from every survey you see that broadband is an experience good. Once you've got it, you cannot do without it, and you just want a higher speed. So if you deliver that to somewhere close, somebody will come along and fix it. Thank you. Andrew? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my uh, idea is uh, that uh, regarding the uh, best investigation is uh, that the uh, best decision is uh, balance uh, between uh, investigation uh, to uh, new uh, uh, to, uh, uh, new gadgets, uh, new uh, 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 kind of transmission uh, from one side uh, and uh, to, bro pro pro to broadband uh, in general uh, and uh, from other side uh, investigation uh, to the social oriented uh, uh, field of life of uh, social society. In this case uh, we uh, as a result, uh, we uh, will have a, a more uh, uh, 
people uh, who will be able uh, to buy this gadget gadgets uh, to use uh, this uh, frequency resources uh, and uh, to uh, promote uh, by this uh, to promote uh, the uh, next investigation in this field and uh, for uh, I return to the beginning of uh, my speech uh, that the, uh, for example in, in Russia it's a uh, very uh, very positive idea uh, to uh, grow up uh, the middle class at uh, the base uh, for uh, economic uh, investigation uh, in uh, uh, the base of uh, e that econo economic uh, uh, economic uh, base uh, for the next uh, uh, <coughs> development uh, of uh, ICT in general and uh, for these days I don't, I, don't, I don't know what will be in uh, 10 or 20 years uh, for these days investigation to broadband Thank you very much, and uh, Luis. Um, so, I think there was a lot of, um, I think there were a lot of different points of view. I, I came up with three things. Um, one is economics matter. The understanding, the underlying economic delivery model of the industry is critical. And this is not about 10, 15, 20 players, it's about two or three. And if you don't fix those incentives, you don't get broadband. Either the government fixes them through a subsidy or you give the guys exclusivity or some other form of regulatory relief, it doesn't get delivered. And this is true in mobile, this is true in fixed. It is starker in emerging markets. This, this is the question on Vanuatu. Um, we've explored in some places do a step function on them, so, so we have different access models, because access is expensive. Access costs a lot of money, so the issue of fiber in Singapore or fiber in Sweden, it's irrelevant, to be honest, to Mali or to Ethiopia. For them, it's a mobile access. Um, and the third, regulation is critical. If you take regulatory steps to reduce the price and to reduce the returns to the industry, you don't get investment. It's not wishful thinking, you don't. The comment about mobile money in Kenya, mobile money is 10% of Safaricom revenues, maybe 15 now. 15% of Safari, so 85% is traditional voice services. 30% of Kenyan GDP goes through that mobile money service. If I am the Kenyan regulator and I sell one more license to induce entry into that market and prices drop 20%, I have blown away all the gains from mobile money in one swoop. So it matters. And it's 30% of Kenyan GDP that is going through that mobile money payment system. So this is, the, the, the levels and the sizes involved are huge, and it matters. Uh, thank you very much, Luis. Uh, we are now at the end of the uh, panel, and we are ran, ran over time. I will, not sum, I will not summarize the summaries, but I will just kind of state uh, an observation, which is a few years ago, uh, discussions at ITU events like this kind of essentially had the flavor of, if we have competition, all problems will be solved. Investment will flow, competition will lower things. Now we're kind of observing things a bit more complicated. The structure, the high investment needs, the low marginal costs lead essentially not to a competitive environment, but more to an oligopolistic environment. And so there is a remaining role of government, and we do have the problems of kind of, of the as desiring an investment and therefore profitability of the underlying infrastructure, but we also want to make sure that the users on the consumer end and the providers on the corporate level of services, of innovation, are also not squeezed out by profit maximizing underlying carriers with market power. So there's plenty of things for us to think about, talk about, uh, but not on this panel because we're now out of time, and I do thank the speakers very much, and to you, the audience, for sitting and listening. <laughs>